Now, when we are choosing drugs for uh, controlling glucose, one must differentiate between drugs that produce a low sugar reaction inherently, which is insulin, versus drugs that do not produce uh, a low sugar reaction. Uh, why do we say that? Because if the drugs which are producing hypoglycemia, that is sulfonylurea, insulin, or magnetinides are in place, hypoglycemia is something that can always happen and that is going to temper the target or the aggressiveness with which one is pursuing the goal of normalizing the patient's uh, blood sugar. So, you have therapies which do not cause hypoglycemia and in them you have metformin. These drugs do not inherently produce hypoglycemia and if these are the only agents being used alone or in combination, then your HbA1c target can be anything. It can be 6.5, it can be 6. You mind you, we are diagnosing this condition at HbA1c of 6.5. So, if these agents are being used, you can have HbA1c target of 6.5 or less. The normal HbA1c is 5.7. You are talking about pre-diabetes. Pre-diabetes, we told you about the blood sugar number. So, if somebody's HbA1c is 5.7 to 6.5, that person is called pre-diabetic. So, if you want to lower the plasma glucose and you are treating the patients well without any hypoglycemic agent on board, then you can lower to whichever extent you want to. If however, you are using drugs which produce hypoglycemia, you have to factor in many conditions. The, the most important thing is, is the patient having good support system, is he living alone? Uh, does he have previous hypoglycemic episodes? Does he have cardiovascular disease? Does he have renal impairment? And all these things will be factored in if you have got a hypoglycemia producing drug in place. If you do not have that, then, then I think you can choose any target. The second thing is that lately, uh, in the past three years or so, there is evidence now to say that certain drugs do benefit the heart. So, if somebody has got atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure or renal failure, then you might give preference to drugs like SGL2 inhibitors or GLP-1 analogs alone or in combination because these drugs have been known to, to be protective in populations who have had prior cardiovascular disease. In people who have got renal impairment, also SGLT inhibitors are known to produce a reduction in the heart endpoints, the need for renal replacement therapy, progression of proteinuria and, and prevention of the renal death. That is death occurring in patients with, with uh, renal failure uh, when there is no other cause like the cardiovascular disease which also occurs very frequently in those individuals. So, if you have got these, then there is a, an indication to use these agents preferentially over and above the other agents after metformin. We did not mention this in the beginning, but metformin is the cornerstone of initiating anybody on, 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 on uh, the antihyperglycemic therapies. And we stratify people based on their HPA1C and based on our target. A given drug may produce HPA1C lowering by at the most 1 to 1.5 percent. But if your target is less than 7 and your HPA1C is 8.5, there is no point giving metformin monotherapy, though it is a very good drug, it is cost effective, uh, it is very easily available, it, is, it does not have many side effects, does not cause hypoglycemia, does not cause weight gain, may actually produce weight loss in some, some individual, not in all individuals. So, you have a person whose HbA1c is more than 8.5. There is no point giving just one drug, you might combine two drugs with complementary mechanism of action so that this person gets to target. There is enough evidence uh, based on the findings of the UKPDS study that early, intensive, aggressive lowering of glucose to the target that you have produces benefit in terms of preventing uh, or postponing the development of not just microvascular complication, but if given for long enough, even macrovascular disease and also preventing mortality. In the very beginning, with agents which do not cause hypoglycemia is very important and relevant. Since weight is a very important uh, parameter and in the causation of diabetes, and uh, some of the anti-hyperglycemic therapies. People feel that if there is a drug which is weight neutral or benefits uh, the weight in terms of causing weight loss as happens with SGL2 inhibitors or GLP-1 analogs, then I think there should be some prioritization or some preference to agents which cause weight loss. 
uh, rather than causing weight gain. Cost is obviously a consideration and if you have someone who is not able to afford uh, the other drugs people can use. These are, are not bad in terms of the cardiovascular outcome. Many people thought that they produce cardiovascular outcome because of uh, causing hypoglycemia and weight gain. There is some evidence in uh, some preliminary evidence in a long term trial wherein there was a DP4 inhibitor being used head to head. Though that trial showed more hypoglycemia in individuals using glimipiride as also some weight gain, the end result that is the CV uh, outcome were, were the same. That means the DP4 inhibitors which do not cause hypoglycemia, but they do produce hypoglycemia and that has to be factored in when somebody is, uh, is giving that therapy. So you have got a host of therapies and all these therapies, the orally active uh, acting agents basically depend on the availability of insulin in the body. So that this can be either produced or its action can be enhanced. Uh, but if there is not enough insulin, typical example being type 1 diabetics, then obviously these drugs cannot be of use alone. And after a certain period of time, the insulin producing capability of an individual comes down and many people do require insulin. And this is not the end of the life. This is just a transition of therapy from uh, oral, easily, easily taken and acceptable route to a therapy which has to be as of now administered by way of an injection. Uh, that is something which, which needs to be kept in mind and all patients with type 2 diabetes must be told this from the beginning, from the time they are diagnosed and this should be not reinforced, uh, not actually they should not be scared, but I would say this should be reinforced time and again that you have a disease that occurs because of deficiency of insulin. The medicine that we are going to give you works through insulin that your body must make they will continue to work for a period of time that there is sufficient insulin in your body. The moment your body is unable to produce insulin, you will have to take insulin from outside. This takes very little time, but it has an important impact on the patient. We are not scaring that patient, we are just telling the patient what the disease is about. And then insulin is, is just another treatment option rather than a, a, a punishment or as some kind of a, 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 a thing that has occurred because you fail to do this or that. Patient knows that, okay, I might respond to medications and that's because of the insulin that my body is going to make. If I am not responding, that is not my fault. It is because there is not enough insulin in the body and the insulin has to come from outside. And we are going to talk much about uh, insulin, but there are various ways of uh, providing insulin and you have to take care that the insulin that is given to you is able to take care of one or both the requirement that we have. In a normal person, we have got a 24 hour uh, presence of insulin and then there is a meal related uh, insulin excursion. So you, this is called the prandial uh, insulin and the previous one is called basal insulin. So if somebody is requiring insulin, one has to see from where this insulin is coming. If you are giving basal insulin, they must be provisioned to provide the prandial coverage either. If you are giving primarily a prandial insulin, which is seldom the case, but sometimes it occurs in acute setting that you give insulin before each meal, a rapid acting or a short acting or a very fast acting insulin, then you must ask yourself from where the basal insulin is coming. And you must also take care of the basal insulin requirement. Eventually, most people who have got insulin deficiency would require both the basal and the prandial insulin, but there is reason to believe that if you start with basal insulin, all things being equal, you, you tend to have lesser hypoglycemia, lesser weight gain and this is more uh, like resembling the physiology that you have and once this basal insulin fails, you can supply the prandial insulin through GLP-1 analog or progressively introducing the basal insulin as a prandial supplement. So this is something about the glucose control. What about the lipids? The classic uh, lipid abnormalities in diabetics are not very high LDL cholesterol. The classical, uh, classic abnormality is high triglycerides, low HDL, uh, normal or marginally elevated LDL and a structurally abnormal small dense LDL. The classical triad of atherogenic diabetic this lipidemia is high triglycerides, uh, low HDL and normal. LDL and structurally abnormal 
small dense uh, LDL particles, this makes it more heterogenic. But the treatment for diabetic dyslipidemia is statins because statins when administered to any individual who had diabetes and dyslipidemia decreased the, the outcomes. So statins are indicated in most people with diabetes and here one goes by, 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 by one standard thing that if somebody has had disease in the past, a cardiovascular disease, a secondary prevention, then all diabetics are required whether they are below 40 or, or, or 40 to 75. But if they do not have uh, a disease that we are using statins for prevention of cardiovascular disease, then one has to consider two things. If somebody has got age less than 40 and has got risk factors like uh, smoking, family history of premature cardiovascular disease or somebody has got uh, <coughs> a LDL level more than 100, then these people might be given statin. Uh, if you are above 40 and you do not have any uh, cardiovascular disease, then you are given a moderate intensity statin which we will talk about shortly. If however these factors that we talked to you just about are uh, present, then you might uh, offer a high intensity statin. All individuals with diabetes who have got previous cardiovascular disease require high intensity statin irrespective of what their age is. If somebody has got age less than 40 and has got risk factor, they go for moderate intensity statin. If somebody has got age above 40 and no risk factor, they go for moderate intensity statin and people who have got risk factors might go for high intensity statin. What is this moderate intensity and what is this high intensity? The moderate intensity is the one which targets to lower LDL by 30 to 50 percent. High intensity statin is the one wherein you lo lower the uh, LDL level by more than 50 percent. Having done this, if you are not able to achieve these targets that we have uh, made out for ourselves, uh, then you can add azetimibe or you can add a PCSK9 inhibitor to, to lower the uh, to the LDL levels to the target that you, you might have ascribed for the patient. Now once you have given statin, you have reached your LDL cholesterol levels, is there any additional role of giving medications? Yes, there seems to be some role. If your triglycerides are more than 200 and your HDL is less than 35 in a well statinized patient, you might consider the use of fibrates and there is now a, a, a statement by the American Diabetic Association that if you have got a person who is having cardiovascular risk and who has got sufficient statin therapy for anybody whose uh, LDL level, uh, whose triglyceride levels are elevated, they have given a very broad number which reaches up to the maximum of 499. They say that for anybody who has got LDL of, one, of the triglycerides up to 499, you can consider the, the therapies. Then they, they have suggested uh, the fish oils, which has uh, caused uh, So the, you can think uh, of giving this medication to reduce the, uh, the risk uh, of cardiovascular disease after you have statinized patients. About antihypertensive therapy, I think uh, everybody knows because the hypertensive therapy is not just indicated in diabetics but also in non-diabetics to prevent uh, the cardiovascular and also the renal disease. And it is important and relevant that we should not get confused between the different targets that are thrown away uh, at, at us or on our faces by different organizations. But many people feel that keeping the blood pressure as close to the normal as possible is important and a level of about 130 by 80 might be good if it is tolerated by individuals. If somebody has got kidney disease, the level might be even a uh, little lower and one tends to prefer uh, the drugs which block the RAS system, uh, either ACE inhibitors or ARBs and then you can top it up with, uh, uh, with, with calcium channel blockers or alpha blockers uh, as the requirement might be because individuals require more than one drug. And uh, in, in thiazide like diuretics have also come a great way in managing uh, anti the, the blood pressure.